So the first question, what is your full name given at birth? Alexandre Vernon Dobchev. When is your birthday and your year of birth? My year of birth is 1934, which makes me 88, and I was born on the 14th of August in Nîmes, southern France. As a child, where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in Nîmes because my parents accidentally got to know each other in southern France, and I was raised uh, first briefly in Nîmes, and then when the war came along, my father showed enormous foresight and he went right up into the Cévennes mountains to look for a place where we might live safely when the Germans arrived. And my mother being English. And um, he found a place. He found a three-room stone cottage high, high up in the Cévennes mountains in a little hamlet called Le Pieux-Sigal. I can't imagine what my mother must have felt when <laughs> she arrived there, but that's where he took us. And so from 1939 to 1946, that is where we lived. And uh, we were safe. It was at the top of a, um, uh, I suppose, there was a valley, and there was a road road that went right up, up the sides of the valley, and went uh, north in that uh, part of France. And we saw all the German cars and tanks and everything going up that road. But they never got up to us uh, in Le Pierre-Sigal, thanks to the foresight of my very caring dad. I owe him. Well, I owed both my parents so much. If any, how many brothers or sisters did you have growing up? None of us. What is your earliest memory of going to the cinema or the theatre? <laughs> um, going to one, I'll have to think. The first cinema I saw was in Nîmes and it was showing Mademoiselle et son bébé, which I think was Bachelor Mother, with either Ginger others or... Uh, my mother would not allow me to go and see it. Growing up, did you have a favourite actor or actress whose work you really admired? Oh, I think Laurence Olivier, even then. It was one of the first films I think probably I went to see was Hamlet his Hamlet, and he impressed me enormously. But, um, oh, there were many. Um, great, ex great Expectations, Martita Hunter's Miss Haversham, and things like that. But I can't remember the first one. Was there an actual event or trigger that first prompted you to seriously consider acting as a profession? And how old were you at the time? Well, um, I suppose, not as a profession, but I was triggered by the fact that my French master put me into a play at school, which was Eastbourne College, and I played things like Malvolio. And then I went up to Oxford University and got involved in the Ouds. And at some point, I suppose, I did consider being an actor then, the Oxford University Dramatic Society where I did some very bad acting. Did you ever attend a stage school or audition, study or formally train to be an actor anywhere? I tried to get into a trade school, in <laughs> a stage school, um, but in some of them it was too late for that year. I had to make a decision rather fast. And in others, they said, well, you, would you want a scholarship? And I said, yes, because we have no money. And well, well, I was at Oxford then. And they said, well, you're 21 or two, and all the other boys and girls coming in are 18. And you've got a different set of problems. So no, 
we can't give you a scholarship, so no stage school. Either before you began your acting career, or maybe when you were between roles at any time throughout your career, what other jobs have you done? Since the beginning of my acting career, um, none. I did. I delivered Christmas mail when I was at school, but not not since I started acting. No. What was your first ever paid acting performance, i.e., your professional debut, and how old were you? Ah, that was in fact a play, which we had played at the Oxford Playhouse while we were still members of the university. Um, Patrick Garland, who became a distinguished director, Michael Simpson, who became a... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> a um, television director. John McGrath had written the play. And um, it was called A Man Has Two Fathers, and I had good, a good part in it. I was thinking I was Patrick's father. And uh, it was a success at the Oxford Playhouse and a professional company called Buxton Productions uh, put it on for one week professionally at the Oxford Playhouse and we were paid. And I must have been... Uh, 20... Four twenty-five. Um, yes. Can you remember how old you were, or what production you were working on, when someone first asked you for an autograph? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> ah, I love it. I have been asked for autographs, but when the first time, I can't remember now. And you have quite stylish writing, handwriting naturally. Illegible, I'm told. Uh, but did you put much thought into the constructing your signature? Oh, no, constructing my signature. I made it as um, simple as possible. Uh, I tried to write clearly because I love the English language and uh, other languages and uh, words, but I'm told that very often my dear friends, Tom Courtney and others, say, another postcard from you, illegible, but I do try. Um, at any point in your life or career, have you ever been starstruck when meeting someone famous, and have you ever asked anyone for their autograph? Oh, well, yes, I can't remember what year. Um, Sir Lawrence... Olivier and Vivian Lee, uh, they were doing a play called um, The Sleeping Prince, which later became The Prince and the Showgirl with Marilyn Monroe. And I remembered I queued up at the stage door of the Phoenix Theatre, hoping for an autograph. And they sent out for the, our programmes and duly signed them a very... Um, amicably, but I never got to meet them because uh, they signed the programmes in the dressing room and then sent them out again. And otherwise, um, well, Marlene Dietrich came to do her rather splendid show at the Wimbledon Theatre. And I went with a friend who was very struck on Miss Dietrich and who absolutely wanted her autograph. And um, so I thought I might as well produce my programme as well. I admired her. And she duly signed it in front of me. Thank you so much. And also, thank you. Goodbye. Um, and I admired her. I wasn't exactly starstruck by that. But um, I suppose they were the first two. Otherwise, I did get to meet various actors, but... I don't think I asked for their autograph. I don't think so. Until I worked with them. And then I asked all my colleagues, from the star actor to the lowest member of the crew, to sign in my um, colleague's book. And they did. Um, 
Only two people decided not to, and they weren't actors. They were directors. I oh, can't be bothered with that. <laughs> Notable directors? One was a good director called Stuart Cooper, I think his name was. I was doing a thing called A.D. in Tunisia with some very distinguished actors, including James Mason and Eva Gardner, etc. And um, everybody signed, and he said, oh, no, can't be bothered with that. But he did tend to address the actors in the order of their billing. And I had a good part, but I was fairly low down after Mr. Mason and Miss Gardner and the others. So that leads me quite nicely. You talk about your college book, but uh, the next question. Throughout your career, were you ever one for collecting any memorabilia? And what, if anything, do you still have in your possession today? My memories. Um, memorabilia. No, I don't think so. Um, I can't think I must have some things at home. I mean, I had a wonderful time working in Japan with the fine conductor Seiji Ozawa and working in many different countries. But Oh, and the call sheets, of course. The call sheets of our, um, or programs, as the case may be, of our, um, of our work. And most of those I still do have, yes. To perform in, what would you choose? Theatre, television, cinema or radio? Ah, well, originally, of course, I thought theatre. And I did theatre for a number of years. And then I loved working in the cinema and indeed television. Though, of course, you have no control as to what is left in the film, what, what take has been used, etc., etc. And radio, I loved doing. I did more in France, actually, in Paris, in French, than I did in England. But now, um, I would love to do radio now, but it doesn't occur. Um, I'm always happy to do uh, television and film, um, especially film. Theatre, it depends for how long and where, because I don't have as much energy as I did, you know. Which of your parts, performances or characters would you say people remember you for the most? <laughs> I don't know. You have to ask them. Um, <laughs> um, well, of course, in some cases, um, performances in say, Doctor Who, uh, in which I was briefly for three weeks and uh, in which I wore a very uncomfortable mask, but with delightful colleagues, and they have become cult things now. Um, it depends. Oh, I suppose, yes, because it's shown a lot on television, uh, a brief part in the James Bond, uh, The Spy Who Loved Me, and another very brief part in an Indiana Jones, um, in which I played a butler with um, Harrison, and things like that, little <clears throat> little things like that. I don't know, you must ask other people what, what, if anything, they remember. Whether it be for what you did on stage or screen, can you name any of your own individual performance or performances that you are personally the most proudest of? Oh dear. Um, I doubt if I'm proud of anything. I'm very grateful to have had the chance to play some parts. And I think I got away with them. I was in a production of Three Sisters at the Greenwich Theatre, um, directed by Robin Phillips, with a very good cast. and. I played Kulig in the schoolmaster, and I think I was sort of all right at that. I played the Prince of Aragon at the Old Vic, directed by uh, Michael Elliott in The Merchant of Venice, and I think I was okay at that, I hope. I really wanted to be, because it's a good part. 
and it led me to six months run seven years later in a play in Paris directed by a French actor-director from the Comédie Française who had happened to have seen that matinee. Um, what else? I've got to say I'm least ashamed of those. One always knows one could have been better, either at the time or on seeing the film later. And um, one always regrets that one wasn't better. Is there a part or a role that you still remember today that you auditioned for and really wanted, but you didn't get? Oh, um, yes, I guess there were a few. I don't think I auditioned for it, but a dear and fine director from television, James Kathleen Jones, directed um, Olivia Manning's Balkan tri trilogy. And on television, it was called, um, I can't remember now, with Ken Branagh and uh, Emma Thompson. And um, there was a part in there I really wanted to play, which was Baron Yakimov. And um, I really wanted to play it, and I think I would have been okay in it. But I wasn't a big enough name for the BBC, so uh, dear Ronald Pickup played it. I don't think I did an audition for it, and James gave me a, a compensatory smaller part in the series. Uh, but that I really would have liked to do. Was there ever a part or an acting role that you had to turn down for whatever reason and again regretted that decision later? Uh, there must have been one or two. <clears throat> and the reason would have been that what I'd been doing previously overran time. Yes, <clears throat> uh, George Roy Hill offered me a part in a film called A Little Romance, I think it was called, with Sir Laurence Olivier, whom I greatly admired. And it was to be shot in Venice, and I accepted it. But uh, the previous job I was doing, and I can't remember what that was now, overran, so I couldn't do it. Can you name a co-star that you liked working with the most, and maybe more controversially, are there any that you had a tougher time working with? <laughs> Most of my fellow actors I liked very much indeed. Um, oh, for different reasons, yes. I mean, uh, when I was in a not very successful film, I think finally called The Horseman, directed by John Frankenheimer, I worked with Omar Sharif whom I greatly liked and who was totally professional and a dear man. And that was a great joy. And um, I worked with Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. Well, with Elizabeth only in one film, but uh, she was about in one of the others. And with Richard in three films. And he was so kind and generous to me. and. I greatly loved working with him, having admired all his splendid Shakespearean performances at the Old Vic before. And what was your question? Who, I, whom who, I was less... I, I, I phrase it as who was tougher to work with, i.e. who didn't you like very much? Well, the one I first remember, whom I liked as a person to have supper with, was the English actor David Warner, who had played Hamlet at the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, and um, Henry VI too, I think. And uh, we were doing a film in Rome, and he was, well, he had a lot of issues. He had terrible um, skin disease, what's it called? Uh, psoriasis. Psoriasis. Psoriasis which troubled him greatly. And um, he was terrified of forgetting his words. And 
when I arrived in the studio, he said, oh, Vernon, you never forget your words, do you, and so on. Uh, can we go through it all, and so on and so forth. I said, yes, of course, etc." cetera. And um, then when we were on the set, um, he arranged to be shot last of the people in the scene. And uh, I had a rather long speech which I had to address to everybody, which I duly did. And when I came round to look at him, he was doing... And I thought, oh, obviously uh, he wants me to forget my words before he forgets his. Well, I won't, and I didn't. And in the other takes, I just looked past him. and. Um, I knew he was worried, and of course he did forget his words. And the director said, don't worry, don't, don't worry. We'll do it one line at a time and uh, close so you don't have to worry. And of course it's what he had wanted all the time. Um, so I thought, well, I will always be happy to have supper with David, but I don't think I particularly want to work with him again. Dear David, he's gone, alas. Um, and I have seen him since then without referring to that. We'll move on to directors now, and I'll ask it in a slightly different way. Outline what a director needs to do to get the best performances out of Vernon Dobcheff, and can you name any directors that you worked with that did just that? <laughs> well, I don't know about getting the best performance out of me. It's for other people to judge. Um, directors are so different, you see. some just wonderful technicians. And if you ask them a question, they say, oh, you're the actor. I've engaged you to do the acting. Don't ask me questions like that. And um, I worked with a, a good director called, a very good director called Roy Bolting, who at one point, I think, married Hayley Mills. I'm sure he did. And uh, it was in a film with Peter Sellers. And um, I realized that he did not really want uh, to be asked questions, so I didn't, until something I had to know, and I wasn't sure about it. And I said, Roy, yes? I said, Roy, do you think? And a little technician beside me said, Vernon, too much rabbit, too much rabbit. Um, but I did ask the question, and he answered it, I think. And there was another occasion when he was asking me to do things which I thought were just wrong for me. So again, I relied very much on friends in the crew, and I knew there was a little technician who had worked with Roy a lot. I said, can you find out for me whom Roy wanted to cast first in this part? He said, oh yeah, I can tell you. Yeah, Cyril Cusack. Cyril Cusack, a very fine Irish actor, but he was hmm, late 60s by then, and I was 20-something. And I said, oh, I see. So when <laughs> Roy asked me to do this thing again, I said, Roy, can I say one thing? Yes, what? I'm not Cyril. And <laughs> he looked very taken aback and said, quite right, do it your way. Um, so I suppose the answer to your question is uh, directors who helped me to do it my way. Um, so here's a left field one for you, Vernon. You are hosting an intimate dinner party and you're able to invite three other guests to attend, alive or dead, in the profession, outside of the profession, who would you choose to invite and why? I would invite Richard Burton, God bless him. I would invi invite dear Tom Courtney, who thank God is with us. And, well, I'd have to invite his wife too, whom I delight in. Um, Oh, it's so difficult. I mean, so many people... Who's your favourite comedian, or who was your favourite comedian, for a little bit of humour? Because that, that might be quite a serious acting night, where you're just talking about the craft, 
with Richard and, and Tom? Well, I, I don't think Richard would talk about craft. He'd talk about Welsh poetry. Um, and I don't think Tom would talk about craft. He'd talk about birds or whatever his current interest <laughs> is in. Favourite comedian? Oh, well, I didn't know him personally, but on screen I thought Alistair Sim was very fine. Um, Well, Charles Chaplin, I suppose, was a favourite comedian in one kind of thing. Um, I would prefer to ask him to dinner in his later period, when he was living in Switzerland, rather than when he was fraught in, um, in Hollywood. Let's go for that then. So we'll say Richard Burton, Tom Courtney and Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> that, that would be a great evening and make sure you invite me along Vernon won't you I will indeed uh, if you could relive one moment of your career once more what would you choose oh hmm, hmm. well possibly playing uh colleague in the schoolmaster in Three Sisters and playing him better. That, that would be good. I mean, I know more about myself now as an actor than I did then. Or indeed the part I played in uh, The Boys in the Band, the American gay play, which I did in Paris for five months for Jean Laurent Cochet, uh, who had seen me playing the Prince of Aragon at the Old Vic. And I played that with Gérard Depardieu, who was enchanting and a very good cast. And I would be better in that now, too. Perfect. Looking back over your career, do you actually have any regrets? If you had your time again, would you have done anything differently or made any different choices at any stage? There was a time when I accepted to do a French play for my dear friend Simon Callow, who was directing it in English. Um, it was in a small theatre in Hampstead, and an interesting part, and I said yes. And then I realised that there were, would be posters all over the north of London and other places with my name on them. And it was a time when I was taking a tax year out of England because I'd done more work abroad and didn't want to pay tax then. And I thought, I can't do it because if my name is on a poster, even though one was earning very little, one was breaking one's tax year. So I had to withdraw. Simon was not pleased perhaps has not forgiven me to this day, because he thought I was going to do a, a film or a television, but it wasn't that. It was... I was sad about that. Tell us something about you or your career that most people would not already know. <laughs> well... I think the truthful answer would be that if you wanted to uh, have a sample overview of my career, if you went round all the trash cans of all the cutting rooms, film cutting rooms of Europe and indeed the United States, therein you would find my career, all the bits that have been cut out. <laughs> I think that's a truthful answer. The one piece of solace is that you were remunerated despite not making it into the final oh, edit, in right? Indeed. One was cast, one was paid, one had, usually, uh, one had the great pleasure of working with a number of fine people, but... The work one tried to do with love and accuracy and passion and wit did not remain on the screen. And a very final question on this part, Vernon, and this is not aimed at you because you're very much still very active, but finish the sentence. Whatever happened to the actor Vernon Dobchev? 
Ah, ha, ha. He sat a lot in various cafes on Notting Hill Gate, hoping that another job would come along. And sometimes they did. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's wondering, but he was very fortunate at the beginning to work in England in the theatre at the Old Vic for three seasons and on British television in some good programmes and productions. Then he worked a lot in France, in French, and Italy, in Italian, in films, and then in Austria and Germany, and in Budapest quite a lot. But each time he was, um, unlike, say, Peter Ostinov or uh, Max Sido, or actors whose movements uh, attracted a certain amount of publicity as they moved from place to place and uh, category to category. He disappeared from one or other of those countries and still enjoyed and relished the possibility of acting and was still occasionally given it. But um, he's older now and he has had fewer parts of late, but he's still going. <laughs>